In the aftermath of the disastrous Exxon Valdez oil spill of 1989, the SCP Foundation received a tip about some anomalous plant life surrounding the affected area. Plants there were beginning to mutate and change for seemingly no reason. With concerns about pollution on everyone's mind, it seemed possible that the plant life had been directly affected by the oil spill itself. After all, humanity's destructive impact on the Earth had already become noticeable even decades ago. However, when the Foundation showed up to investigate, they found something much stranger. All of the mutated plants had a common substance on them, in their pollen, seeds, roots, or the surrounding soil. And we're not talking about the millions of gallons of spilled crude oil. No one had ever seen this substance before, and all tests on it proved inconclusive. They collected samples of it and began extensive studies on what would become known as SCP-1100. Though SCP-1100 was initially classified as safe in the Foundation records, it would quickly reveal itself to be anything but. The first entry in SCP-1100's official file described it as a complex organic substance that causes anomalous transformations in natural plant life. It can be transmitted between plants by way of pollen and seeds. Within 72 hours, an infected plant becomes dangerous or hostile to human life. During testing, Foundation researchers exposed a variety of edible plants to SCP-1100, artificially pollinating the plants with samples of the compound. Tomatoes, apples, strawberries, carrots, and cabbage were among the plants tested. As the fruits and vegetables ripened, many visual differences became apparent right away. The skin of the tomatoes thickened and darkened into an off-putting leathery brown until it was incredibly difficult to bite through or even slice into with a knife. When the tomatoes were finally cut into pieces, the flesh was coarse and dry. The cabbage took on the appearance of rotten food, growing a fine layer of mold as the leaves became slick and oily. The strawberries sprouted incredibly sharp thorns where ordinary strawberries simply had seeds, becoming unsafe to eat. The carrots and apples were visibly unchanged, but had some unfortunate side effects when fed to D-Class personnel at the site. The carrots induced nearly instantaneous vomiting and dizziness, triggering a seizure in one particularly unfortunate subject. The apples, on the other hand, had developed hard, sharp structures near the core. Much like the classic urban legend of the razor blade hidden in the Halloween apple, personnel who sampled the fruit suffered lacerations to their gums, tongue, and roof of the mouth. Whether through disgusting appearance, tougher skin and thorns, or harmful side effects, all of the plants were rendered completely inedible. Initial containment procedures were not terribly strict. SCP-1100 was kept within the secure biohazardous material storage unit at Biocontainment Site 33. This seemed to adequately contain the substance, until one day, during a bit of routine scientific testing. A large amount of SCP-1100 was gathered for experimentation, when out of nowhere it vaporized, disappearing into the air. Not only did it contaminate the plant life specifically set aside for the experiment, but it traveled through the vents and infected all the plant life being grown at the site. Specifics of the incident have been redacted from the record, but 70% of the on-site personnel were killed in this containment breach. In the aftermath, the remainder of SCP-1100 was moved to Biocontainment Site-26. The object's class, formerly listed as SAFE, was upgraded to Euclid. After it was transferred to Site-26, experimentation with SCP-1100 resumed. After being exposed to the substance, this new round of plants transformed in a variety of ways within 48 hours, with increasingly disturbing results. A mango tree underwent a chemical transformation. The fruit, previously ripe and fragrant, became filled with highly corrosive acid. When touched, the transformed mangoes would burst, spraying this caustic liquid all over the person who touched them. Long vines of common ivy developed muscle-like internal structures. One poor D-Class made the mistake of putting his hand a bit too close to an infected ivy plant, only to have it wrap around his hand and crush the bone into powder before he could get away. A rose bush's thorns elongated, hardening and sharpening to the point comparable to a knife. Another rose bush excreted a toxic substance from its thorns that, when tested, was found to be similar to the type of neurotoxin found in the deadly cone snail. As these experiments continued at Site-26, Several of the researchers assigned to SCP-1100 noticed that it would become increasingly dangerous to contain, and that its effects were becoming stronger, more pronounced, and taking effect much more quickly. At this point, no source could be found for the substance, 
though a theory was posited by Dr. Smith that it was the creation of a radical environmentalist group, with access to resources and technology on the same level as the Foundation. A task force was put together to monitor environmentalist groups around the globe for possible hints about the creator of SCP-1100. During the course of the experiments at Site-26, SCP-1100 vaporized spontaneously again. It spread throughout the office in record time, wiping out 96% of the on-site personnel. At that point, in a desperate attempt to stop the infection from spreading to the other sites or even into the civilian world, a research assistant made the choice to detonate the on-site nuclear warhead. The infection was stopped, but all remaining surviving personnel were killed in the blast, and the surrounding area afflicted with irreparable damage. SCP-1100 was moved to a triple-redundant hermetically sealed container, stored in a containment chamber at an unlisted Foundation site. The container is checked daily to ensure that it is still completely intact and able to hold the substance. If anything should happen to the container, SCP-1100 is to be immediately transferred to a new one. After the devastating loss of Site-26 and additional experimentation, SCP-1100's class was changed from Euclid to Keter. This allowed the Foundation to allocate additional resources to its containment, seeing as safe and Euclid containment procedures had both resulted in catastrophic loss of human life. And in both instances, they had been profoundly lucky that it hadn't been worse. After determining that exposure to SCP-1100 would make edible plants unfit for consumption and heighten the danger of otherwise normally innocuous plants, the Foundation became curious about the effects the substance might have on animal test subjects. A variety of species were selected for the animal trials, including deer, mice, cows, chickens, cats, and dogs. The deer and the mice, both ordinarily considered to be docile prey animals in the wild, were the first to be exposed to SCP-1100. Within 24 hours, they had become much stronger and more aggressive. One of the deer was able to break down the door of an observation room by ramming against it with its head. Once it had broken out of the room, it proceeded to charge and attack any person that it saw. The mice became prone to swarming researchers and biting them wherever they could, with jaw strength capable of biting through hazmat suits and even biting one person's finger clean off. Any attempts to subdue the animals were futile, the creatures somehow fighting off even the strongest sedative. The only way to prevent the infected deer and mice from continuing to attack was to terminate them. Next, the cows and chickens were exposed to SCP-1100. They did not display any behavioral changes once exposed, nor did they show any increased strength. The cows and chickens continued to behave normally, going about their days as if nothing had changed. They did not respond to the presence of humans with the exception of feeding times, during which they would approach only to eat their food. A selection of the livestock were slaughtered in order to perform an autopsy and look for anomalies in their bodies. Everything looked unchanged, until some of the meat was prepared for consumption and given to a selection of D-Class personnel. The beef taken from the infected cows was impossible to digest, causing a dramatic amount of gastric upset, cramping, and vomiting. Testing showed that, inexplicably, it had no identifiable nutritional value. The chicken, on the other hand, became highly toxic, showing lethal levels of cyanide and arsenic naturally present in its flesh when tested. Like with the fruits and vegetables, exposure to SCP-1100 made the cows and chickens impossible for human beings to eat. The cats and dogs were the last to be experimented on. No matter how docile and friendly the animals were at first, within 24 hours they had become vicious. At the sight of any human, they would attempt to attack. Like the deer and mice, they could not be subdued by any level of sedative, displaying shocking levels of strength and resilience for their size. One D-Class lost his arm, and another had his eyes clawed out before the subjects could be terminated. Whatever SCP-1100 was, it made everything it touched dangerous to humans. Even man's best friend could be convinced to turn on him in only a single day. As might have been expected, given the significant loss of life and the destruction of two different Foundation sites, Experimentation with SCP-1100 has been suspended until further notice. The substance went from affecting plants and animals within 72 hours to accomplishing it in 48, and then 24. It is becoming more efficient and more dangerous. If allowed to continue adapting, it could someday transform infected organisms in only a minute. If the substance ever escapes containment again, defoliants and desiccants are to be deployed within a 1 kilometer radius of the infected area, and the area must be quarantined for 12 months.
If the situation becomes dire enough, nuclear or chemical weapons may be deployed in order to distract the public and provide an acceptable explanation for the quarantine. How had things gone so horribly wrong so fast? Bits of surveillance video were recovered from the ruins of Site-26, providing a glimpse into what exactly happened before the entire site was destroyed. The footage pieced together is not entirely conclusive, but here's what we know for sure. A Foundation researcher referred to as Dr. V disarmed and shot the armed guard at the entrance to SCP-1100's containment facility. While he did this, another Foundation researcher known as Dr. M entered the containment and took the sample of SCP-1100 out. The footage cuts off for a while here, but it becomes clear when the video resumes that Dr. V and Dr. M dumped part of the sample into the site's water supply and vaporized the rest of it into the air. This is believed to be the cause of the mass contamination that occurred at the site, which was previously thought to have been accidental. Dr. V and Dr. M were later linked to an environmentalist organization on the Foundation's watch list. During the investigation of Dr. V and Dr. M, a diary was discovered from Dr. V's home. In it, he wrote about his personal theories regarding SCP-1100 and where it might have come from. While his colleagues proposed SCP-1100 was some sort of deliberately engineered bioweapon, Dr. V believed it to have a far more organic point of origin. He stated plainly, It's a planetary immune response. It's Gaia, Mother Earth, fighting back against us. The more we try to fight it, the worse it gets. She wants us all dead, wants us gone because of what we've done to her, and there's nothing we can do to stop it. He concluded the entry with the assertion that the only thing humanity can do now is accept the punishment the Earth wishes to give us. This was his final entry before he and Dr. M triggered the destruction of Site-26. Were the doctors right? Should we just accept that the Earth is done with humanity and ready to drive us to extinction before we can do any further damage? The jury's still out on that. Perhaps we can turn back the clock, mitigate the harm done to the natural world, and attempt to earn back its favor before it's too late. But if SCP-1100 ever makes its way out of containment and reaches the plants and animals of our world, turning them all against us one by one, we won't have much of a choice. Now go check out SCP-XK Class End of the World Scenarios Explained and SCP-2000 Deus Ex Machina for more SCPs that could cause or prevent the end of the world as we know it.